Now we move to uh, Jonathan Hodge. Uh, Professor Hodge is uh, very familiar with the Cambridge environment. Um, he was here as a trainee in biology and the history of science in his undergraduate years and is well known for his researches on theories about the origin of species. He's published widely in this particular domain. Having left Cambridge, he took up various teaching and research posts in the United States and then returned to the University of Leeds. He has co-edited The Cambridge Companion to Darwin, again a recent edition of which I think John has been uh, released. He will ask the question in his presentation, how could Charles Darwin have all these impacts? John. <laughs> And if you can do that in eight minutes, you're a genius. Thank you very much. Um, what I shall try to do in these eight minutes is this. If Darwin had been a parson naturalist, then he couldn't have had the impacts that he's had. But he wasn't. He was a very long way from being a parson naturalist, so he could have had those impacts, those diverse and enduring impacts. I want to emphasize then about Darwin himself that he was a compulsive, abstract, speculative, general theorist. He notices this in himself with some anxiety because he thinks it may be, in fact, not a virtue uh, in a, a, an ambitious young man of science. But, uh, as Gillian has already emphasized, he uh, reconciles this compulsion in himself with his duties towards the norms of science in a very straightforward way. He does his speculating privately in private notebooks, and sometimes at the end of a uh, paper, published paper, but uh, he earns his credit as a scientist. Sure, yep, yep. Um, I have strayed, as they say, uh, but now I'm found. Um, uh, the, uh, and he, earned, he knew that his credentials as a man of science, as one used to call them in those days, depended, of course, on uh, not being irresponsibly speculative um, uh, without uh, um, producing you know, proper observational evidence. Darwin was also taking sides, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. I'm not too bothered about that today. Um, he was taking sides on very large issues. Um, and some of those very large issues that he took sides on were what we call enduring issues. Some of them go back to ancient times, to the early uh, Greek philosophers uh, or the early church fathers and defenders of the great monotheistic faiths in the Middle Ages, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and so on. Um, for example, and one we've already touched on, um, the four great schools of Greek philosophical thought, three of them thought there were purposes in nature. Plato's school, Aristotle's school, and the Stoics. The atomists didn't. Darwin is clearly taking sides on those issues, not in an equivoc unequivocal way, um, but in a way that we're still discussing. Is he closer to the Epicureans, as Jacques Monod wanted to say, a chance and necessity only person, or is he a chance plus necessity plus design person? Um, again, Darwin took sides on enduring issues concerning the respective roles of nature and nurture in human character and human faculties. Um, he was a strong innatist, in fact. Um, and uh, that, of course, again, that issue, what is predominant in humans, nature or nurture, uh, something, again, that Plato and Aristotle had disagreed about. Um, now, as I say, Darwin would not be this sort of person taking sides on these enduring issues if he had been the parson naturalist um, of some stereotypes. The parson naturalist is stereotypical of Darwin on the BBC and also in children's books about Darwin. And there's often quite an overlap between the way BBC portrays things um, and the way children's books do. Um, <laughs> in this stereotype, of course, he's an innocent, theory-free observer 
uh, rather in the tradition of Gilbert White of Selborne. Um, of course, Darwin drew on that tradition, but lots of others as well. Um, let me emphasize um, that there is no consensus about the traditions that Darwin comes out of. Um, some want to say that through the influence of Lyell on him, he was a, a child, in effect, of the late Scottish Enlightenment. Um, others want to say that Humboldt was the decisive influence, and Humboldt um, is an early German romantic, so Darwin must be that too. Um, the obvious response to this is that he was all of these things, and that he was capable of being because, he, for one thing, he was a compulsive reader. He read enormously. He read a lot on the Beagle Voyage, or lots of books on the Beagle uh, itself, and he was someone aligning himself with all sorts of different positions. Um, there was one big division where he's clearly aligned. Um, there were two monthly reviews in those days, the Edinburgh Review and the Quarterly Review. Roughly, the Edinburgh Review maps onto the Guardian and the Quarterly Review maps onto the Telegraph. Um, and there were serious issues at stake. Um, University College was started by the Edinburgh Review people in London. The King's College was started by the Quarterly Review crowd. Um, and the Edinburgh Review was dominated by Edinburgh lawyers and medicine people. Um, and they were liberals. Um, the Quarterly Review was dominated by uh, conservatives. Um, and uh, was aligned with the Tory uh, party and, and Oxford. Um, and it's easy, I think, to be misled if we stand in Cambridge thinking about Darwin. We tend to think, oh, Darwin's an Oxbridge boy. Um, he was planning to be a parson. Well, he was briefly. Um, but I think if we look at the biography as a whole, we see him as first of all in, aligned through his family with, with the, the, the lawyers and the medics in, in Edinburgh. Um, he briefly, so to speak, signed up with the Quarterly Review faction, um, but reverted while on the Beagle voyage, um, came back not wanting um, to be uh, a parson naturalist, um, but uh, uh, aligned with Lyle and with Robert Grant, his mentor in uh, Edinburgh in zoology. Um, one of the issues that divided people like Lyle and Grant on the one hand from people like Henslow and Sedgwick at Cambridge was Cuvier, the great Protestant Christian uh, French savant um, he was a hero uh, to Sedgwick and to Huell and to uh, Henslow um, and the Oxbridge people generally, the Quarterly Review crowd, if you like. Um, uh, Lyle and Grant tended to side with Cuvier's French opponents, Prévost, Lamarck, and Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire. Um, and Darwin uh, aligned himself eventually, as I say, um, with the anti-Cuvier faction. Um, with University College, if you like, and with the Edinburgh Review. Um, and that was in part for family reasons. Um, and never forget, Darwin was the grandson of Erasmus Darwin. When Charles Darwin opened his notebooks in July 37 on the laws of life, he put Zoonomia at the top. That was the title of his grandfather's best known book, a book he had first read with the encouragement of his Edinburgh mentor, Robert Grant no one at Cambridge would have encouraged Darwin to read his grandfather's book, Zoonomia. Um, it, Paley, in his books, which were acquired at Cambridge, had in effect preached against Erasmus Darwin. Now, the, one gets light on the sort of theorist Darwin uh, was by noticing how his losing theories came to lose. He had a neo-neo-Huttonian or neo lyellian theory of the earth where things go up and down tirelessly. Theories like that were discredited by thermodynamics in the 1870s and the 1860s. Um, Darwin had a theory of reproduction called pangenesis, which drew on German cytology of the 1830s. Unfortunately, German cytology had changed by the 1860s when Darwin published pangenesis, and it died by the new German cytology, just as it had lived off the old German cytology in the 1830s. Now, you, you Parson naturalists don't come up with theories that die like that at the hands of thermodynamics or German cytology. Um, of course, Parson naturalists don't come up with theories like the theory of natural selection, theories which have unexpected and unanticipated uses long after Darwin dies. The theory of natural selection is alive and well in cosmology today, thanks, for example, to Lee Smolin. Um, it's alive and well in elderly uh, 
um, Skinnerian psychologists uh, who emphasize parallels between operant conditioning and selection by consequences. It's very much alive and well in medical schools uh, where the clonal selection theory of antibody formation uh, uh, dominates uh, immunological theory. Um, and again, one has to ask, one minute, one has to ask, um, you know, how could Darwin come up with theories having that sort of enduring and expansive future to them? Um, I've already implied my answer. Let me make it explicit. Um, Darwin, through his reading and his family background, um, was constantly engaging the enduring issues, the ones that go back, as Eliot has indicated, go back to Greek and early Christian times and medieval times, questions about chance, necessity, and design in the universe, questions about nature and nurture. Um, of course, he engaged them as they were discussed in his own day. We discuss them in different terms. Um, but he was, therefore, someone, if one is contemplating his career as a whole, he, he calls out for an intellectual biography, does Darwin, the same way that uh, Descartes calls out for such a biography, or D'Alembert, or Freud, or Chomsky. Parson naturalists don't call for that kind of intellectual biography. Charles Darwin is the kind of person who does call for it. Thank you.